Hey everyone, welcome to Maker Camp. Today is Theoretical Thursday. I'm Camp Director Nick Raymond. Uh, we have an awesome program for you today. Uh, we're here with uh, Lamore Freed, uh, Lady Ada from Ada, Indus Ada Fruit Industries. Hello, uh, that's me. Uh, we also have Josie and Max hanging out with us from the Make Labs. How's it going, guys? Good. Pretty good. Hey guys. And so, as always, uh, we'll be taking your questions today. So, under the comments in the post, uh, just ask us some questions. We'll have Max and Josie uh, read those to uh, Lady Ada for you. And uh, before we get going, we'll ask uh, Lamore, how did you start uh, Ada Fruit Industries? What's your background, school, and uh, how did you become an awesome maker? Um, so, I actually, when I was a kid, I used to take apart stuff all the time. So I was, I was definitely like a maker at heart from the very beginning, um, like disassembling VCRs and stuff. Um, that's what we had before DVD players. And um, I ended up wanting to do like math and then I ended up getting a computer. And um, this is kind of when computers like kind of were first into the home, like Apple IIs and stuff. And I thought programming and writing games was just so much fun and cool and you could be really creative on a computer and like make art um, and like write stories and animations. And I ended up going to school for computer science actually for a long time and that's the study of programming and how to program computers in, in efficiently and effective ways to build large software systems and stuff like that and I thought that was kinda cool I did that for a couple of years and then kinda halfway through I sort of decided like you know like computers are cool but you're always sitting in front of a screen and I got a little tired of sitting in front of a screen all the time nothing wrong with it but I want to do something else so I ended up uh, changing my major to electrical engineering and um, what's cool is that electrical engineering and computer science have a lot in common. They're different, but they have so much overlap that I could take a lot of the skills that I learned as a computer science student and then bring that into electrical engineering and build electronics. So basically, um, physical stuff that uses programming. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today is the intersection of um, electronics and programming and how nowadays, um, especially since like microcomputers and microcontrollers, it's so easy to combine the two. So uh, yeah, we'll be talking about electronics and then also programming. Awesome. And so um, what is some of your background with school? I know you uh, went to MIT for, for computer science and engineering. Um, and you also kind of helped develop or kind of pioneer open source and kind of get a definition for that. And can you talk about that? Open yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I went to school actually at BU for a couple years. And I studied computer science there. And I transferred to MIT. And that's where I did. Um, electrical engineering, although at the program there, you have to do both. It's it's combined program. You can't really oh, do it's a one. Program. Yeah, it's 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 like you have like they basically just squish like eight years into four years. Um, mm -hmm. Is what they do. So it, it was a little painful, but um, I got the shirt out of it, so that's good. Um, and uh, you know, as I was graduating from MIT, MIT is really known for their contributions into open source and in education. You know, they do the MIT X program and open courseware. And there's a lot of sharing at MIT. People share a lot of stuff, information and papers and knowledge. And so when I graduated, I wanted to take that philosophy of sharing um, that is used in open source. And what open source means is that when I write a program or when I design something electronics, I give away the recipe, the plans of how I do that so that other people can follow it at home. And that's kind of what we do at Adafruit. We basically write these tutorials, and I'll be showing off one of those tutorials later. And then people can build it at home. We don't keep that a secret. We, we try to give it away to everybody so that they can all make it. Basically, the cookbook of electronics and programming. Awesome. And so what is uh, Adafruit Industries, and how has that kind of developed over time? Um, so Adafruit Industries is the company I founded after I graduated. I want to do electronics, and I kind of want to do it my way, which is this open source style where I um, build projects and design stuff, and then I give away the plans. And the way the business works is um, we sell kits of parts and components that if you want to follow the tutorials and the projects, you're going to have to get all these ingredients. And so we're basically like that supermarket. So it's um, you know, not a bad idea, right? You have a supermarket that has all the ingredients, um, and you give away the cookbook for free but you still have to buy the ingredients, there's no way around it. So that's kind of how the business runs. And I've been doing it since 2005, and we have um, hundreds of projects and tutorials, and almost um, a thousand um, items in the store, all sorts of electronic goodies. And I try to get stuff that's kind of weird and rare, that's hard to get um, from normal places, so that people can build really unique and uh, interesting projects. Yeah, awesome. I gotta, say, I gotta say, that looks exactly like the warehouse we have. <laughs> yeah, this is the Adafruit warehouse. I'm in the storage warehouse. There are boxes, boxes and boxes. Awesome. Okay. Should we uh, get into uh, kind of more of the um, 
the theoretical aspect of today. Mm-hmm. Everything all good? I guess there's no more questions. No questions to start, which is good. Um, so, yeah, today's Theoretical Thursday, and um, I guess because I've taken both computer science classes and electrical engineering classes, um, Nick and Rose, uh, Josie and Max have asked me to uh, basically teach everything about computer science and electrical engineering in 45 minutes, which is pretty exciting. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to take a couple of water breaks, definitely. Um, so what's interesting about electrical engineering and computer science is that they both have to do, like, computer science is you write programs on a computer, and a computer is electronics. And so basically, you can think of it as sort of like, like the base is electronics, and above that is computer science. So electronics is, is a little bit lower level, but there's still a lot of stuff that you can do, and it's, it's really interesting in its own right. Like, uh, sometimes people say, like, well, I don't need to learn electronics because I just have a computer, and the computer does everything I want. But there's a lot of stuff that um, when you combine electronics and computer science together, that's when you have a lot of fun. And that's kind of physical computing or like Arduino projects. It's kind of the, the combination. And um, I want to actually start from the very beginning because a lot of people don't actually even understand what electronics is. Um, and so it's going to be it's going to be a little theoretical. And you know, it, it's okay if if you know the viewers. Don't understand the full thing. It's, it's, I understand that it's theoretical, so sometimes you're like, well, I don't have that physics or math. I've never, you know, I don't really know what the atom model is or whatever. That's okay. Just try to get the big picture, and it's going to get more and more interesting. So, you know, if the beginning is kind of like, well, I don't understand, like, what an electron is, that's okay. Just, just stick with it. And then uh, as we continue, you'll see uh, it get um, higher level and higher level until it, it, it becomes this beautiful art form. So... <clears throat> Electronics, uh, you know, a lot of people say, like, what is electronics? And, and the definition is uh, using electrons, okay? <laughs> Which is like a really stupid definition because it's like, okay, electronics is electrons. Okay, so what? Well, uh, electrons are these little particles. They're some of the smallest particles we know of, and they're in um, all atoms. All atoms have electrons. So there's like electrons everywhere. Like I'm made of electrons on the, on the surface, and this camera is, this computer is. We have electrons everywhere. But for electronics to do what we want to do, we can't just have electrons like, you know, in this piece of paper. Those electrons aren't useful. We need to have free electrons. And so, like, what does that mean? Okay, so we're surrounded by air, right? Hopefully, all you guys have air. If you're not the Mars rover, you're, yeah, you're like <laughs> drowning because uh, you don't have any air. Um, so we're surrounded by air. But let's say I have a, a pinwheel, which everyone hopefully has made as a kid. So this pinwheel isn't moving even though it's surrounded by air. That's because it's not air that makes this move. You can't just have static air, air that's just sitting around. You have to have air that's moving, right? So I'm going to have moving air, and it's going to make this pinwheel turn. OK? So I generated moving air, and that air makes this spin around. So I got it to do something. But now that the air isn't moving, it's, it's just sitting here. So that's kind of what electronics is. Like, even though there's electrons everywhere, we need to harness these electrons and make them go in one direction, just like that air. And when the air goes in one direction, it spins the pinwheel. So to spin a pinwheel, we need wind. Okay. And if you've taken a class in like kind of earth science or atmosphere science, um, you know that wind is created by um, high pressure moving to low pressure. So like you know when you watch the news and they're like, there's a low pressure zone moving in, and you're like, oh, what? Okay, what does that mean? Like, am I stressed out? What kind of pressure is it? It means air pressure, right? So if you have high air pressure, that's something that, you know, it's trying to hold the air in, and then there's low pressure, the air will expand into the low pressure and it'll make wind. Okay, so like that's really theoretical and vague. But I can do that at home using a balloon. So this balloon has no air pressure right now, everything's the same. Mm -hmm. But I can create a high pressure area inside a balloon by charging it with air. <laughs> They've got a balloon, and this is high pressure. There's high pressure inside, and then outside is lower pressure, right? So this is held inside, but if I release it, all this high pressure air will move out into the outside and will create wind, right? So now I've got my pinwheel, and this is going to be a little difficult because it's hard to hold this up. Great hands. Maybe I'll have my assistant <laughs> hold the pinwheel. <laughs> what lovely hands. <laughs> if I do it right. Well. Okay. 
Well, it's not very good. But yeah, 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 you know, you see a move. I could spin the pinwheel. It's kind of tough to do it in front of the camera, but the air stored, the air difference between the pressure in the pop, the blown up balloon and the outside would create that wind. You can feel on your face when you, you know, release a balloon into your face. Okay. So now you understand how air from high pressure to low pressure creates wind, and that wind moves a pinwheel. Okay. So now we're going to use what we know about air pressure and move that to electronics. So okay. electronics, just like air, you need high pressure to low pressure, and then electrons will move. But except inside of pressure, we call it voltage. That's basically it, right? Okay. That's basically what voltage is. It's a high pressure area moving to a low pressure area, and then that forces electrons to move. And so you're like, okay, well, what do you mean by that? And I mean um, a battery. So this is a battery. It's kind okay. of a battery. You probably know what a battery is. Everyone, yeah. everyone has batteries and stuff. So battery is basically like this balloon, except this is a dead battery or dead balloon. Okay. This battery has a pressure inside of it, except it's electronic pressure, and it can it gives you 1.5 volts. That's the pressure difference, so that electrons can move. It push the electrons through. Okay. So now let's say I have another pinwheel. This one's a smaller pinwheel, though. Let me grab this guy. This pinwheel is on a motor. Ooh. Got a little motor. And this motor, it's 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 got a pinwheel, and you, you know you've seen the pinwheel, and and you know I can spin it with air still, but this time I'm going to use electrical pressure, electrical voltage. I've got a battery holder, and I've got two batteries. Maybe you might find an assistant can just hold the batteries, and then I'm going to just use this alligator clip wires, and then I'm going to connect this here. So now we've got this pressure. All right. And the batteries. And that electron pressure, the electron flow, just like air, is moving inside the motor, and it makes it spin. So we've got an air control pinwheel, and then we've got a motor control pinwheel. OK. That's kind of like the, the basics of what voltage is. Does that, does that make kind of sense? Yeah, it's a, it's a difference, right? You want to have a, yeah. a voltage difference or a pressure difference. Right. I mean, it, so the thing is, is that like, it's not the actual, the absolute pressure of the balloon. It's only, you know, because if you're in a, in a compressed space, and you have a balloon, um, and the pressure is the same on both sides, you won't, you won't make that wind. It actually has to be the, the balloon has to be more pressurized than the outside. Inside. Yeah, the, sorry, the inside of the balloon has to be more pressurized. Okay, so um, I have to give, make sure my notes so I can, I can keep going. Okay, so when we have um, a balloon, the more I blow it, the bigger it gets. So that's the capacity. And just like with batteries, if you have a small battery, so this is a AA battery, and this battery is a pretty small battery. Now, if you have a D-sized battery, um, that means that you've got uh, more capacity. It's basically a bigger balloon. And then if you want to have more air pressure, you'd have to, you know, basically have really good lungs. You could pressurize this more and more and more, and you could, you know, pressurize it all the way, and that's more voltage. So. When you have, um, if you want something to run longer, you need a bigger battery. And if you want something to run harder, like you want the wind pressure to be stronger, you have to have more batteries in a row. So for example, um, lamps need 120 volts. So that's like 100 of these batteries, and, and you need a lot of pressure to create light. Um, but we can actually do that. Um, without having to have 120 volts by using an LED. And this is the second thing I'm going to introduce. So this is an LED. So you've probably seen LEDs because um, LEDs like are on in your iPhone or whatever. There's a little LED. Or like on your computer, there's little blinky things. So this is a special type of semiconductor device. And just like the motor, it con converts voltage into spinning. And, and if you put a pinwheel on it, it can create a, a, like a fan. This converts um, voltage into light. So I'm going to okay. grab this battery pack again, and I'm going to use the alligator clips. And yeah, this time I'm going to light up this LED with some batteries. Bang! That's really Ooh, bright. That's a bright so this one. Is a red LED, and um, inside is a, is a semiconductor. It's this kind of special material. 
And um, this material is kind of interesting. When it's hit with electrons, it releases photons, which are like particles of light. So okay. everything, you know, all light is made out of photons, little particles of light, which is kind of unusual, but um, that's what we figured out. So this one, this kind of um, semiconductor, when you hit it with electrons, it gives off red light. And then we also have one here that when you hit it with electrons, it gives off blue light, which is kind of cool. And so you can see it's blue. So I don't know if you can see, Lamore, but hmm. in your screen, it's like you have a lightsaber, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because of the, the camera. Yeah. It's actually a dot of light. But yeah, there's a little bit. The camera gets a little confused. It's like, that's really bright. Yeah. And then we also have um, a green LED. And we'll be talking more about LEDs, but... Yeah, so you've got red, green, blue. You actually get purple, pink, white. So depending on how they make the semiconductor, the silicon, you can get different colors of light. So um, the interesting, now here's like the really interesting thing. So when you can, um, you can, first off, you can combine LEDs into different colors by uh, combining the lights. But um, another thing that's interesting is that um, LEDs can work backwards, which is really unusual. And a lot of people don't even know that, uh, even though they, they do electronics. So this is a converter from electrons to light. So you, when you throw electrons through it using a, a battery, it, it emits light. But it also works the opposite way. If you hit it with light, it'll create electrons. Wait, that works? Yeah. Isn't that really? weird? So the interesting thing about physics is that physics, well, this is really, really theoretical. Basically, there's no reason why the, the universe doesn't work backwards. There's mm -hmm. actually no real reason why everything can't go backwards except for like the laws of entropy. So I was going to ask, yeah. <laughs> yeah, other than the laws of entropy, there's no reason. I mean, that's the only thing keeping time moving forward. Otherwise, time could move backwards. Just really, really theoretical. Um, but uh, let's uh, demonstrate this. I've got a source of um, mega electrons. This is a, a, a huge lamp, which nice. I will use to, um, to create a lot of uh, photons. And it's it's really bright, yeah. Ooh, so and a... I've got also let me see where my oh um sorry I wanted to introduce one more thing before I, I got to the lamp. So the problem with all these electrons and voltages and like all like photons we can see we have photon detectors they're called eyes so that's really handy we can we can detect stuff with our eyes like these LED colors and that that's really good but we can't um, detect voltage I mean you can stick a nine volt on your tongue. And then mm -hmm. you can kind of feel it a little bit, but that's a really that's not suggested, uh, especially as you get to higher voltages because they can hurt you. Um, and lower voltages we can't detect with our our feeling. Like, we don't have fingers that can detect it. So instead we use things like a multimeter, and this is a really big old multimeter. And a multimeter is is a is a special tool, and it can this one's really old and really big, which is why I like it. And uh, inside it has um, special circuitry that can turn. Voltage and current, you know, voltage and electrons into this dial. You can see this nice, awesome dial. That's a nice dial. So um, this dial will move, so you can you can detect it that way because we can't see and you know, even though we can feel air pressure, we can't see electron pressure. It doesn't. Unfortunately, humans just weren't made like that. I don't know. So um, next step maybe, evolution. Huh? Yeah, I mean, we would evolve for that. I mean, like I could see how like if evolution continued for like the next couple million years. Like we're surrounded with electronics. Eventually we'll probably be able to like detect like radio waves and stuff using our, our brains, but I don't, I don't know. Okay. We won't need to, we'll have prosthetics. <laughs> there we go too, yeah, yeah. Or, or you can have a, yeah, you can have something that connects to you so you can, anyways. So um, I'm going to use this um, awesome ginormous uh, multimeter and I'm going to show how, for example, we can measure um, the battery voltage so I'm going to switch over to the other camera because otherwise I have to hold this up. Okay. Okay, so you see, do you see the big dial? Yep. yep. Okay, go big dial. So um, I have it measuring voltage, and here is the, um, the battery pack. So if I connect the batteries like this, you can see oh, – let me uh, – yeah, you can see the dial moved mm -hmm. all the way. Let me. There you go. That's a little bit better. So yeah, as I um, 
take it away, the dial moves down. So this is how I can detect voltage. So this is telling me it's like three volts, which is about right. Two, two one, one and a half volt batteries next to each other is uh, three volts they add up. Okay, so this, now we know like, okay, you know, you can get um, this electron pressure of this voltage out of batteries. But next we're going to do a cool trick where we use an LED um, and we'll, we'll continue looking at this dial. Um, and I'll, uh, actually, can we go to the over, actually, uh, no, I'll, I'll show it here. So I've got this LED. Okay. And it's clear because I wanted it to be like a, I didn't want to have any colored um, lens on it. And I'm going to hook up this voltage meter, this voltage reader to the um, LED. And then I'm going to shine a really, really bright light into it. And then um, we're gonna see, you're gonna see this um, dial move. Okay. So. Do you uh, do you get better results if the color of the light matches the color of the LED? Shh, 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 shh. Don't, don't don't ask that yet. <laughs> ask that in like, like two minutes. Okay. So uh, <laughs> you see how the the dial is moving? Yeah. So there's no battery here. It's, I'm literally just holding up the LED to the lamp. So I'll show you what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I've got this. I've got this little LED, and okay. I've got this lamp, and I'm just holding it underneath. Really, I mean, this is basically like sunlight. I'm basically creating sunlight. Okay. So the, that's really your question, actually. Now, now we can talk about your question. So, now we're ready for the question. <laughs> yeah. So the really interesting thing is, is that, like I said, you know, like this LED or like the red one. Is specifically going to make red light, and then the blue one specifically makes blue light. So, and they're tuned that way. They're made so that they specifically only make like one color because, like, it, you know, that way you get the brightest effect because it's like only one color. So, yeah, if you have um, red light, um, you want it to be, um, you want to use a red detector because it will, it absorbs that light. It's specifically tuned like a radio to that frequency of, of light, and likewise the blue one. But, okay, so you're thinking, like, wow, like, if I could hold up LEDs to the sun to create voltage and, like, then, like, you know, that voltage, you can drive electronics, you can, like, charge your MP3 player from it. Um, the only problem is, is that, like, that little LED, like, I don't have a microscope, but the LED itself, it's in, a, it's in a piece of plastic. But the actual semiconductor is, like, one millimeter by one millimeter. So you'd have to get, like, a couple thousand of them together to actually make enough like pressure in order to like actually run something like a motor or like your computer. So um, some people had a really good idea. They said, well, wait a minute. What if we make just a really, really big LED? Right? I mean, that's what you're thinking, right? Like, Next step, yeah. Let's just make a gigantic LED that when you hold it up to the sun, uh, it generates power. And like they did, and it's called a solar cell. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so a solar about... cell, it's just weird. A solar cell and the LED are actually basically the same thing. Except that this is specifically made to generate light, and this is specifically made to absorb light. But the semiconductor inside, it's the same basic thing. It's, I mean, like, this doesn't emit light. Like, if you, if you try to power it with a battery, like, it's not it meant to blow. emit light. That's it, what I was going to ask. It doesn't blow, yeah. It, but it, it's meant to absorb a wide spectrum of, of, like, what we call, like, earth sunlight, that kind of, that kind of light, which is kind of a sort of whitish, bluish whitish color. Um, so yeah, so for example, I've got this um, solar cell, and this solar panel will convert photons that come in and shoot down onto it into electron flow, and it comes out these wires at the end. Okay, so that, that's like a kind of like a deep philosophical thing. Do, do you have any questions about the, that weirdness, that the LEDs are solar panels and solar panels are LEDs? I actually have a question about the LEDs. Um, is you say that the red LED emits red light. Is that because it's in a red casing? Or no, I, I, I picked the red casing specifically so it can show up on camera because I didn't know how the camera would show up. But for example, this LED is red and it's in a clear casing. This is just, it's, it kind of gives it a nice uh, glow to it. Um, the, the deep reason why it emits red is that um, inside the material, um, an electron hits it and, and there's electrons in a certain energy band. And that energy band corresponds with exactly what sun like what, what red light is. It's like six hundred and fifty nanometers. Like it's 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 obscure, but basically when you when you smack it with electron, um, a photon gets released. Kinda like 
if I if I smacked my assistant, he'd go, ow. You know, it's kind of like that. It'd be a um, red ow. <laughs> yeah, you're like, ow. So you hit them, but it doesn't work the opposite way. That's the, the strange thing. Another way to think about it is kind of like those, um, those you know, those desktop Newton balls that like yeah. hit each other and then they, they go back. It's a little bit like that. That's kind of how electrons move also, um, except that they can release photons once in a while. So... Yeah, so this is kind of interesting. So whenever you see like an LED, you're just like, oh, it's just like a really, really teeny solar cell. Um, okay, so we've got these. So, oh, sorry, uh, Josie and Max, did you have any questions or? Uh, I had a couple. Go, first, go for it. Now's yeah, your time. First, first of all, um, uh, I the uh, the uh, using the LEDs to read voltage is that actually uh, practical as like a sensor? Yeah. So it's actually it's a good question. There actually have been. Uh, projects that use an LED as a sensor because um, not for not for generating power. It's not power, as you saw. It's like it's really weak. It's like I mean, you might be able to get a really big LED and and then you can power a little LED, but like it's very inefficient because it's not meant to be. Um, they're not designed for that purpose. They don't have like you know the lens and everything to make it work right. But there are um, projects um, like Mitsubishi Electric. They came up with the idea of using um, an LED as a touch sensor. Because when you touch it, it goes dark, and so it can detect when your hand covers it. That means, you know, maybe it, it means to do something like. Um, uh, actually, a, a really good example of this is um, like for a phone. Like when you hold it up to your ear, you want the screen to turn off, so you can have like a, basically a detector that's an LED, and it detects if your um, head is nearby because it got dark. So like that was one of the examples that they thought of. I can't remember my other one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know. so blown away that a photo cell and LED are the same thing, yeah. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I know it's, it's a little theoretical, but it's kind of, I don't know, I find it really interesting. Okay. So now we've got, I have to remember what I was going to show next. Okay. So, um, so now we've got the solar panel, and I'm going to do another demo with the solar panel. So the solar panel is really powerful because it's, nice, it's a nice big solar panel. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine the solar panel with the motor. So basically, I'm taking photons, light, converting it to electrons flowing out of these wires into the motor, which then converts it into wind, because it's really hot in here. And, and it's sunny, so I want to, well, let's say we're outside, it's August. So we're outside, it's really hot and sunny. I can convert that sun energy into a fan that can cool me off. So um, I'm going to use these wires again, the alligator clip wires, and then connect them up to the wires of the solar panel. Just hang out and think of questions while I'm wiring this all up. Yeah, Max, I was going to say, um, I did a project at school. We did, um, it was more circuit building exercise, but we used an LED to emit light to a rotating wheel that had strips of aluminum foil on it at certain intervals. And then we use a second LED that was positioned around top of it, and that would take the inputs um, as the light would bounce back off the wheel. And then, mm. so you get like an RPM gauge, you know, you could test yeah. the, uh, how many revolutions per minute. Okay, cool. Um, maybe my kind assistant will hold the motor. Thank you. And I'm going to use this fake sun. It's not. It's it's bright in here, but it's not bright enough for a solar panel. Solar panels actually they need to have uh, a lot of light. So I'll put this here, and then that's it. So it's it's no batteries involved. Sorry, there you go. So yeah, we can create wind. Oh, that's nice. Um, by converting light to electrons to rotation to wind. Okay, so we're like having a party here because we're now combining all sorts of weird stuff. Okay, so the other question is: is you're like, okay, well, you've you've shown me that LEDs can be run backwards, and then that's a solar panel. Um, so well, what about this motor? And I'm like, that's a really good question you just asked because in fact motors. Or like LEDs can be run backwards, which is weird, but let's try that out. So um, I'm going to take this motor with this PDM. Now, I'm not sure how well this is going to work because it's not going to be very bright. But I'm going to connect the motor directly to an LED. OK. OK, so hold on. Let me just make sure I get, yeah, I think I got this wired correctly. Let me just test it further. I want to make sure I got it right before I Embarrass myself. So, I have to blow really hard, unfortunately. Okay. 
Uh oh. I think this. The fan okay. won't be nice. <laughs> yeah, the fan's not nice, but you know what? I'll spin it by hand. So let's just, we'll just pretend like I, uh, so uh, maybe my kind assistant can hold this up to the camera really close by. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing right There it goes, yeah. It's flickering. So I'm turning it with my hand because I'm cheating because uh, I don't have a very good, <sighs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so you can see it's, it's, again, just like the LED is in a very good solar cell. Um, me twisting this by hand, I'm not a very good generator, which is what this is. So if I put this um, motor with this pinwheel up in the sky, yeah. that's a wind generator. So that's what you see when you when you see pictures of these really, really, really big fans. They're basically just a motor, the same kind of motor that's in um, like you know an electric car, basically. But it's um, up in the sky and it's really, really windy. And then uh, it can power your house if your house needs to be lit up by LEDs. So the cool thing about all this stuff is that you can combine it in any way you want. So you can have solar panels that can light up LEDs. And then you can have a generator which powers a fan. Or you can have a generator that powers LEDs. You could even have a generator, like a wind pinwheel generator, um, which creates power that then lights up a big lamp that then shines on a solar panel that you know powers a wind machine. I mean, you're going to lose energy every time because it's not very efficient, especially when it's like you're twisting it by hand. But you can do that because that's the cool thing about electrons. You can create them. You can create electron flow or, or, or use it. Um, and that's how we have like green technology, like solar panels and generators is, is basically people said, hey, wait a minute, all the stuff that we have, we can run it backwards. And so I think that's kind of neat. So that's how you can create um, electricity using the same stuff that you can use to use electricity. So you can you can really you know you know this this is sort of the same principle that's used in the power grid today. We've got a we've got a camper asking uh, can a solar power uh, solar panel power a desktop computer? And, yeah, uh, it has to be a really big solar panel. <laughs> really so big. the only the only thing that's a little bit um, unfortunate about all this stuff is it, it's it's actually. It's very difficult. Like a lot of people think, like, oh, a solar panel um, is sorry. I'm showing sure you the solar panel. So this solar panel, um, this is a three and a half watt solar panel, and watts are the, a, a measurement of how much pressure and how much current. So how much electron pressure and how many electrons this can emit. So this is three and a half watts. So most computers are, I think, like 50 or 100 watts. So you need to have 30 of these. Yeah. to um, power like a desktop, especially a, a powerful desktop computer, which is why a lot of people think about how can we use electronics to reduce power usage because um, you know, the solar panels are actually kind of expensive. You, know, like if you have to make them and they have to be very clean and they have to be big and it has to be a perfect crystal of, of this, you know, this LED. Like, to making an LED, it's only one millimeter by one millimeter, but this is um, 150 millimeters by 150 millimeters. You have to make like a perfect sheet. It's very difficult to do um, perfectly, and so that's why um, solar panels are, you know, they're kind of expensive. So if you needed 30 of these to power a computer, that's why you can't just solve all the energy problems of the world right now with a solar panel. They're, they're actually just not efficient enough, even though we're getting them to be better and better. Um, right. They're really good in, like, deserts or in locations where we don't um, have a way to get them electricity any other way. So, like, um, satellites use solar panels because they're close to the sun, and we can't beam electricity up there yet. So instead, they have big solar panels. So that's how they, they power themselves. So it's, it's important to keep in mind that um, even though we can make electricity using solar panels and motors, uh, it's it's not it, it, you know, nothing it, it, nothing works quite as well as uh, burning fossil fuels fuels right now. Right. So that's uh, you know um, a teaspoon of gasoline has um, more power than like twenty. Uh, solar panels running for an hour, like it's, it's really it's like energy rich. They, they're very yeah. It's it's surprisingly uh, when you burn it, you can create you can emit a lot of energy. Whereas even though there's a lot of sunlight, it's very hard to capture it very effectively, very efficiently. So as, I mean that's kind of why we try to reduce our power usage, not just replace all of it with um, solar panels. So you know you're better off turning your computer off at night than putting solar panels on your roof. Because the universe can run backwards, but doesn't like to. Well, yeah, it's it's more like the, it's just very difficult to get power from the sun. It's just like it's it's just we don't have a really really good way of doing it yet. We're still working on it. So this is only solar panels are only fifteen percent efficient. They only capture fifteen percent 
of the energy of the sun. Now, if they were carrying, ca capturing like 85%, now we'd be talking. That's a lot, but we haven't been able to figure that out yet. Okay. Uh, any other questions before I move on to the next thing? Uh, we've got one from way, way towards <laughs> the uh, from way back when you started talking. Uh, uh -huh. Does the name Adafruit stem from Ada Lovelace? Um, in a, in a long, uh, twisted way, yes. Okay. <laughs> but it went through many revisions first. Um, but yeah, the, my my um, handle when I was on PBS is Lady Ada, mm -hmm. um, and so then I was like, well, I have to form a company, and I was like, well, I'll just use that handle and and turn that into a name. Okay, so I'm going to take a really uh, quick water break, and then I'm going to sh talk about computer science. So finally, we'll get to the computer science part of this. Okay. For those who don't know, Ada Lovelace was uh, or Ada Lovelace. I can't remember which, was uh, is considered by many uh, to be one of the first computer programmers uh, in that she, uh, she uh, published, uh, she and Charles Babbage, uh, Babbage published a lot of programs for his uh, analytical engine or whatever it was called. Yeah, also very theoretical. They didn't have a computer yet, but they had ideas about what a computer would do. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've talked about electrons, and I basically um, explained kind of Electronics. I mean, that's really electronics. It's basically the converting of those electrons um, into, um, you know, I showed how to con convert them into wind, and you can convert electron flow into light. Um, a speaker coil, which is kind of like a motor, is a way of converting um, electron flow into uh, sound, right? So your speaker, it's made out of a coil, and when you put voltage and current through it, it pulses, just like the motor spins, except it, it's a, it moves this way instead of around. Um, and then if you do that fast enough, you can create sound. I didn't, I didn't bring an audio demo because it probably wouldn't sound quite right with the camera. But that's um, another thing that's really interesting. You know, a speaker and a microphone, they're the same thing. You can use a speaker as a mic and a mic as a speaker. Um, We're demonstrating it now. Huh? We're demonstrating it now. Yeah, that's well, yeah, pretty much. Um, except that a microphone is very, very small and very, very sensitive. And a speaker is really, really big and meant to be really, really loud. So. Um, if you try to actually play music through a, microscope, a microphone, uh, it would um, probably burn it out. And if you uh, use a speaker as a microphone, um, it's very weak. It's hard to get a good signal out of it because it's not very sensitive. But um, so the next thing is that, okay, so now you've, you've moved all these, like, you are like master of electrons. Electrons bend to your will. Um, and that's really great. But um, electronics is a little bit, um, I don't want to say like blunt, but it, it's not very precise. Exactly. I mean, it can, you can do precision, certain kinds of precision electronics, yes, but um, controlling stuff, if you want to do like really complicated things, um, you actually need computation. You need to have data. And that's where computer science comes in. So whereas electrons are like moving stuff around, like electrons around to, to create light or create motion, like robotics, or create sound, um, you still need to control it somehow, right? You need to be able to do what you want with it. And so, for example, um, I showed off uh, the LED, and I'm, I'm going to show another quick LED. I'm going to get my little my mini battery so I can hold it up easily. So here I've got a coin battery, just because it's really small, and I've got an LED, and uh, I can I can light up the coin battery with an LED. And um, okay, so I'm using electrons, but then let's let's say I want to turn it off. Okay, well I just I just remove the battery basically. And I can put it back, and I can remove it. And so I can I can actually kind of do like Morse code for SOS if I'm like really careful. Um, but it's uh, very tiring. I have to hold my arms up, and that really sucks. So uh, instead, what we might want to do is we want to have a computer control an LED. So what the computer is doing is it it tells it basically sends the LED like, okay, I'm going to send you some electrons, so light up, and now take those electrons away, and now you're dark, and now I'm bringing them back to you, and they light up, and then I'm taking them away. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of the, the most basic electronic project you do is usually blinking an LED, and that's why everything around you has blinking LEDs, because everyone loves blinking LEDs. So let's say we have like a bunch of LEDs in a row, and I'm going to show them off right now. So actually, let's go to the overhead. That's one of the best ways to look. So we'll go to the camera. So I've got uh, a whole bunch of LEDs, and they're just small versions of these big LEDs. And to control them, I'm going to use um, an Arduino. An Arduino is actually a computer. I know a lot of people don't think of it as a computer, but it's a computer. 
Um, it's basically a very, very small computer, and I can send it a program. I can write code and tell the Arduino, the, um, this little processor brain inside, to uh, do stuff with these LEDs. So it can light up the LEDs in any order I want, and that's all kind of fun. Um, and then one of the things I can do, because I actually have code ability, is I can tell the LEDs to light up in a certain sequence. So like, for example, let's say I have this picture of, oh, sorry, can you go to the uh, overhead? We have, we're going to have to switch back and forth, unfortunately, because uh, I want to show both. I have this picture of a heart. Hmm. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, so you got a heart. And I drew this heart using uh, pixels. And this heart is actually data. It's information. I know, okay. that's weird. That's really theoretical. Okay, yeah. <laughs> your mind is blown. Um, what I want to do is I want to make the LEDs that I have light up in this order. I want them to first light up in this column order, and then this column order, and then this column order, and then this column, and then this column, and then this one, and then this one, in a row. So I'm kind of feeding it through the LEDs, and this is the data that I'm sending to the LEDs. Okay, so let's go back to the overhead. So I have this information, and I'm going to. I'm actually going to do it like this. So I've got the first row of. One second, let me just uh, bring this back up. I've got the first row of information. Hey, people, hey there. I've got the first row of information that I'm going to send, and just like the punch cards that um, Ada Lovelace used, I'm going to uh, pretend this is like a punch card. Um, so the first row is going to be. Um, I'm going to draw this row. This is the first row of the punch card. And Lamore, can you explain what a punch card is? Oh, a punch card is, is uh, it's a way of, of the, uh, they used to send information to um, computers, and they'd have these, um, literally a card made out of cardboard, and they'd have holes in it. And it would, it would send, the, that's how they would give information to the computer. And that's basically what I'm doing. So you'll actually understand what a punch card is um, by me going through this. So it's going to be a little bit weird for a few minutes, and then it'll make sense. It's kind of tough to explain computer science and like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll try. So um, look, we're gonna go through and we're just gonna um, process this data, this heart image, kind of like a scanner. Okay. So um, let's go back to the overhead. Okay. So I'm going to convert this data into what a computer speaks, which is ones and zeros. So this is a zero, and this is a one. I don't know if it's visible to get. Maybe I'll write it up here. One, 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 zero, zero, zero. So this is the first data I'm sending to it. Zero, one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And then I'm going to go to the next line. And the next line is one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero. So that's the next line of data. And then I'm going to move to the next line. And the next line is one zero 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 one zero, and that's how computers speak. They speak in ones and zeros because I don't know. They don't have ten fingers. They only have you know bits. You can converse in ones and zeros. So I can go through this and just like a scanner that scans an image, I can convert this image of a heart into ones and zeros, and then I can send that to this Arduino using programming. And that's what programming is. It's basically sending this kind of data, the image that's being scanned in into ones and zeros, um, and typing it into the computer. So now I'm going to go into my programming window, which is what you run on the computer, to input this program. So hold on, let me change over. OK. So now I've got. Maybe I'll make this window a little bit smaller. So I'm going to be using the Arduino, and I'm not going to cover it in depth because it's it's you know it's it's many hours of, of learning. But basically, here I can you read the text that says set column? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do in in my program is I'm going to set the column of LEDs to be um, as you remember uh, zero one 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 zero zero zero, and then one zero 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 one zero zero. Like if you you probably don't memorize the 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 
the numbers I just wrote down. But those numbers that I wrote down, I copy them into this program, and I'm going to tell it, hey, I want you to display those bits, 100, zero, zero, and turn them into LED light by controlling the voltage. So that's the combination that. of programming to electronics. So I'm going to um, upload this code to the Arduino by compiling it and uploading it, which is unfortunately the bane of programming is most of the time is spent um, compiling the code, turning it into the machine language and sending it. OK, so that's done. Um, and then let's go to the overhead. If you actually squint at that program, you can actually recognize the heart in the, uh, in the one. Yeah, the you can. It's t I mean, like, I, it's tough because I, I, I put delays in it. Um, so now I've got the heart data sent in LEDs. So, hold on. so you can kind of see the beginning of the heart, and then it kind of goes like that, and then like this, and like that. Okay, so it's a little difficult to see because I don't have tons of room here either. But yeah, uh, sorry, that. So can you sort of see the heart image being traced out? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So now that's basically like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm holding the battery to the LED and I'm turning it on and off, and it's like, Awesome, but it's unfortunately uh, very, very slow. Now, the thing about um, computers, especially in Arduino, is computers are very, very, very fast, um, much, much faster than people, um, although they can't think the same way people can. So um, right now I have it pausing half a second and then sending the data to the LEDs, the, the data that I wrote down, ones and zeros, to the LEDs, and I'm having it wait half a second and then sending the next chunk of data and then half a second. But I can speed that up a lot. So let's go back to the programming window and program. OK, so now I'm at my programming window, and you see here where it says delay 500? Yep. That's, that's it saying I'm going to wait 500 milliseconds. So that's a half a second. Okay. But um, I'm going to have it wait only 5 milliseconds, so 5 uh, one thousandths of a second. So and this will speed it up. And right? this will speed it up. Okay. And so it's going to be like really fast. And you know what's interesting is that 5 milliseconds for um, a uh, computer is like really, really slow. Mm. Like, like computers, like they run at like like three or four gigahertz. I mean, like millions and millions of instructions a second. That's cool. All right, so I'm going to upload this code. Let's go uploading. Okay, so now let's go back to the overhead. If we can. Yeah, this is like the one part where we're going to go back and forth real fast. Okay, so now we're here, and now you see it's updating it every um, five milliseconds. It's so fast that our eyes can't detect it because it's updating the data so fast. Except what I can do is I can wave it in the air. And then, hold on. Let me uh, just turn off the light here so it's going to be more easy to see. We have like a camera crew here. No, not really. <laughs> OK, so remember, you just saw these LEDs. Oh, wait. Yeah, you saw these LEDs. Yep. And, um, they're, they're blinking so fast you can't see them. But then if I wave them in the air, Whoa. you can see it's, it's camera to pick it up. Is it picking it up? You can see it in the beginning really well, yeah. Yeah, it does. I, I have to, I have to, the camera has to pick it up exactly. You can see the, the heart being drawn. Every, mm -hmm. every few that was a good one, yeah. It has to catch it right when I'm waving it. So that's an effect called persistence of vision. And um, it's a really cool effect. So I can actually draw a picture using only seven LEDs, which is um, really neat because, like, I you know I'm cheap. I only have like enough money for seven LEDs, but I can actually draw like a full picture with all these LEDs. So that's um, a, a really cool thing about adding data and, and processing the, the data processing capability to electronics. So with electronics, I can light the LED. Like we've, we've seen that, I can light the LED. I can control the motor. But then computer science is what tells you, okay, the robot will land on Mars, and now it's going to go one mile this way, and then it's going to shoot a photo, and then it's going to store it, and it's going to analyze it. So you have to, co you have to combine electronics and computer science to do the really cool stuff. Um, one isn't really enough. If you only know electronics, you're like, OK, well, I made a motor move um, or an LED light up. But then if you know computer science as well, you can make um, blinking versus division things. Yay, hearts. OK. <laughs> doesn't show up very well without the, the, the um, light off. Um, so now I'm going to go back to some basic theory. Um, and hopefully most of the campers um, have done drawing and painting. And so they know that you can combine colors together to make other mm -hmm. colors. So we've got red, 
green and blue. And um, if you have just one light on, you have red or green, but then when you combine red and green together, you get uh, yellow. And if you combine uh, red and blue together, you get violet. And if you combine green and blue together, you kind of get like teal. Uh, and you combine all of them together, you get white. And um, the cool thing is with electronics and computer science, you can put these LEDs on and off um, so fast and to create multicolored images. So, for example, um, this, I'm just going to show this off really fast. Basically, this is a strip of LEDs. And um, each one of these white squares is a, is a really bright LED that has red, green, and blue combined inside of it. So, um, Those are tiny. Yeah, they're really small. Ooh, this is like super you know, custom cool stuff. But um, because they're all in a row, you can do some really interesting uh, light painting with it. So now I'm going to show you photos because I don't have uh, space here to do a big light painting demo. So do you get the uh, do you get the same uh, light combining effect with larger LEDs, or they have to be uh, so small? Uh, the the smaller they are, the you know the the more of a point source they are, and so they combine better. Ooh, nice. um, just you know, the best thing is to have. Very, very tightly packed, very, very bright LEDs. So, um, for example, these are some photos showing a strip of light, and um, this is uh, mounted onto a bicycle. So, because it's a little, it's interesting to see how it goes. So, uh, click on. so is the bicycle growing around in the circle, and that's what it looks like? No, it's actually a hula hoop, Ooh. and then the LEDs are attached onto the outside of the hula hoop to make a, a ring of LEDs, and then. They're connected to the back of a tricycle, so you can see uh, in this photo the the hoop is spray painted black, mm -hmm. and then it's attached to this bicycle with a big battery, and then this is the trike. It's like a recumbent trike. So um, it's, all, it's all black, so it doesn't show up on the photo. Yeah. So then what you do is you take a camera and you you put the camera so it does a long exposure, so the camera uh, takes a long picture, mm -hmm. and then uh, like this has a. a a snake pattern on it, and then you know you open up the camera focus shutter, the shutter, and then you bike around um, with the image that you programmed in using the ones and zeros technique. Except uh, you automate it a little bit because doing it by hand takes a really long time. And that's how you can do um, light painting. So combining the electronics of LEDs um, and generating light photons from electrons, and then the controlling capability of computer science writing the program to actually um, convert that image into light. So is that what you would have seen if you were also watching it um, like on the street? Or do you have to have a camera to actually get that long exposure time? Um, for really, really big pictures like that, yeah, you need to have a long exposure because it's like he's going a block. But um, I've, I've made um, strips. And if the photo, if the image is like only this wide in space, your eye will catch it all at once. Oh, okay. That's, that's cause, you know, like I showed uh, waving the heart. You can see that, like if you were here, you'd be like, oh, I see that floating in the air. And a camera can pick it up. But for really, really long exposures, like light painting exposure, uh, it needs to be dark outside so you don't get all the light from the sun interfering. And then you have the exposure on for a really long time. But that's like, you know, that's kind of taking the, the basic heart project that we just did to mm -hmm. draw heart in air. Uh, and then it's just like supercharged. So, well, we've got a question from uh, from Sean. Uh, Sean. Um, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> I, I always believe. in my head I'm like, see, no, it's not like. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, <laughs> like an H in there. I uh, it, he says uh, I hooked up an LED to two batteries and it was bright and after a few minutes it got very hot. Can oh. you describe how to reduce the pressure so it doesn't isn't so bright and hot? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, actually, it was going to bring a, a, a lot bigger battery pack, but I didn't because I didn't I didn't want to blow up LEDs on uh, on camera. But um, oh, why LED, not? <laughs> well, well, I didn't know if it was going to work, and like you wouldn't like you know you have to do it, and if you don't see it, and I have to keep using LEDs, and I, I wasn't so sure. But um, LEDs, they're they're not meant to. They're you know they're kind of like um, like a light bulb, or like actually let's like if you take a something like a light bulb that's meant for like 120 volts and you go to Europe where they have 220 volt power and you plug it in, it'll just pop. Like, hopefully this has never happened to you, but if you take electronics that aren't meant for the 220 volt power they have in Europe and you try to plug it in without a transformer or converter, um, it'll actually damage it like shavers because um, they have motors in them. They'll burn out. So just like a light bulb can burn out, LEDs can burn out. And um, the reason that can happen is like let's say I have my pinwheel. So that's, I'm going to go back to the air pressure. 
Um, so as long as like the air is not too strong, this will spin just fine. But let's say I put this behind like a jet engine. Um, it'll just completely destroy it. And the air pressure is just too high. This isn't really meant to deal with that. This is meant to deal with like, oh, like I'm on a windy day and I'm outside. Like that kind of air pressure. It's not meant to deal with like crazy air pressure, um, like from a, a jet engine or like a massive, massive fan or like a hurricane. Um, just like umbrellas aren't really meant to deal with hurricanes either. They're only meant for like, you know, light breezes and stuff. So likewise, um, like just like this pinwheel can't handle really, really high pressure air because it'll blow apart. Um, an LED can't handle really high voltage pressure. It'll blow apart. So let's say I had a really, really big balloon. Um, and I blew this up until the pressure was just like unbelievable. Um, and then I released it onto the fan, it would blow the fan off. In fact, that kind of happened before. It kind of was falling apart because this releases the air pressure very, very fast in a really big gust. And so what you need to do is kind of like, you know, you charge up your battery, you charge up, you know, your, your balloon. Now, if I just let it go, it'll fly all over the room, right? I mean, I don't want to do that. But if I want, I can release it very carefully just by slowly releasing it. So you can hear just a little bit of air is leaving. It's like slow, like so it's like now half as much air. Now if I release it all at once, like it's all gone and, and, and you know it's like goes all over the room. But if I'm very careful with how I can control the valve, the, uh, the neck of the balloon, I can um, reduce uh, the speed at which the air comes out. And so I reduce the wind speed. And so what I'm doing is I'm adding some resistance to the air. So the air um, has, it has to fight against my fingers, and so my fingers are adding this resistance, right? So it's to fight against it. And so in LEDs, we use the same thing. We use resistors. And they're kind of the same thing. They're like these little necks. And so instead of air pressure having to go through a little hole or a little neck, like the balloon, it has to go through this resistor, which is sort of like an electron neck. And an, electro, an electron neck, otherwise known as like a resistor, um, prevents the... Um, the electron flow from going so fast that it heats up the LED and the LED can damage. And so that's why you often have an LED with a resistor. I didn't get to have time to cover resistors, but I just kind of did. So, um, you know, there are a lot of L uh, LED resistor calculators online that will show you how to calculate the resistor value because it's not super easy. But as long as you have the right resistor, um, you know, in line with the LED, the right neck between the air pressure source, your balloon, and the pinwheel, um, which is your LED, you'll be able to keep it running for a very long time without damaging it. Before we try to get back on topic, we've got another question. Okay. Uh, might as well get them over with. Um, we've got a question from Scott. He asks, how many processes can the Arduino do per second? I think he's asking about instructions per second. Yeah, so the Arduino, it's actually interesting. The Arduino runs at 16 megahertz, which means it's 16 million instructions per second. Is it one instruction per cycle? Uh, that's a very complicated question, but for now I'm going to say yes. <laughs> like advanced computer science, you learn about pipelining. Um, essentially, it's one instruction per second. Compare that with um, a computer which runs at um, five gigahertz. So that's five thousand million instructions. So it's it's you know a thousand times faster, but also has a lot of sub -pro like a computer doesn't have just one computer in it. Actually, it has it has like multiple processors that all do stuff. So that's why um, things are actually much much faster than that. It's it's easily ten to to um, fifty thousand times faster. But the first computers that came out, like even the Apple II, only ran at four megahertz. So an Arduino is actually four times faster than an Apple II. So it's a, you know you can actually do quite a lot. Um, even with uh, such a small processor. I mean, we went to the moon uh, with a computer that I think had one megahertz processor. So <laughs> you can go to the moon on one million instructions per second. You don't need that many instructions per second to do what you want. Right. Although um, I, I, I did, uh, I have heard before that with these little, uh, these little micro, uh, microcontrollers that are just in plastic casings, this is something I've heard before. Uh, which is that you, you, in your main loop you want to include some delay or also cook the processor. Uh, I don't know if that's true. Um, that's not that's not really true, but you might overload. Um, th the reason you might not want to do it is, for example, if it's sending data out to something else, it'll get overloaded. So that's why often there's a delay. Um, so for example, if you're sending data from the computer or back from the microcontroller to the computer, even though the computer is very, very fast, um, it's not expecting something to send it so much data so fast. Because the, the Arduino is just sending data so fast, it won't, it won't cook it, it won't damage it permanently at all. 
but it might overload it a little bit. It might slow down because it's like, oh, there's so much data, and I was expecting that. So that's just an old wives' tale. I think it's an old wives' tale. All right. One thing is you can't send an Arduino to space because it's not, it's not a hardened against radiation. There's a lot of radiation in space, so it actually wouldn't work out. You need to have a special type of chip that can handle like radioactive waves hitting it because of the ozone layer. All right. Cool. Great. Are there yeah. any other questions? You can also ask questions if you want. Yeah. <laughs> now should we get back on to, I think there was one more thing, uh, yeah. Lamar, for the yeah. hangout? Mm -hmm. No, oh, sorry. That's it. No, that's it. Oh, that's it. Oh, awesome. Yeah, no sorry. Um, I thought you were like, there's something. No, I finished exactly on time. I, perfect. I, I it to be like one wow. hour. So, yeah, I basically, I, I'll just try to do a review. Um, so, what, what I was trying to do in this 45 minutes is, is present the basics of electronics and kind of demystify some of the words that people use, like current and voltage and voltmeter and LEDs and, you know, diodes and what all these things are. Um, and and electronic support is a, is a massive field, and there's like tons and tons of stuff you can do, and it's not just blinking LEDs, although that's the most fun to show on camera. And um, then also talking about programming, which is taking information, data, and then manipulating it and doing stuff with it, and not just you know having it um, tweet or post your Facebook account, but also um, taking drawings, like this heart drawing that I made, and converting it to binary data for the computer, and then have the computer control those LEDs uh, by using voltage and, and current and electron flow to make light paintings. And then, um, you know, for the super advanced, you know, it, you can always take this much, much farther and make these gorgeous light paintings that our friend Phil made using a tricycle. And uh, so that's why I think that computer science electronics is really fun, because it's not just... Um, you know, sitting at a desk all day. I mean, you do sit at a desk a lot, unfortunately, while you're planning all this stuff out. But then, um, you know, you can create really, really beautiful things. You can make art with electronics and uh, computer science and uh, have a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, so, like, this is kind of what I like to do. And uh, it's kind of what we do at Adafruit. So if you like some of these projects, uh, check out learn.adafruit.com, and we'll post up in the, uh, the Hangout uh, thread as well so you can check it out. And we have, like, hundreds of projects some are, which are very beginner, um, some which are very advanced. Um, if you want to get into electronics, I was just picking up an Arduino, which will uh, introduce both electronics and computer science, and you'll get to looking at these very fast. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lamar. And um, if you want to find out more information just about you and some projects that you're working on, is that the best website to get yeah, you? Yeah, check out uh, the uh, learn.adafruit.com and the blog.adafruit.com, which is where we post like dozens of times a day. I'll also check uh, the Make website, of course, which awesome. does tons of awesome projects, and also the other um, the other camp hangouts. I'm sure there's going to be more that have uh, electronic stuff in them, so you can check those out. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's tons of information online, so I'm I'm sure that if you start with those links, that if you're interested in it, you can uh, take it further and further. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lamore, and uh, thank you, Max and Josie, for joining us today. Uh, and thank you, Lamore, for uh, cramming all that into 45 minutes. I'm okay. Excited. Thanks, uh, uh, Nick, Josie, Max. Thank you, Google, for having this hangout. And, of course, thank you to Make and Maker Camp for uh, hosting us. And uh, be sure to check out all the other Maker Camp videos. I'm sure there's there's like 20 or something, right? Uh, yeah, we're on day 23. We'll have 30 at the end. So uh, okay. we'll go into uh, through, through Friday. Tomorrow is going to be actually heading to CERN. We're going international. Awesome. Uh, we're going to and check out CERN. Uh, get behind the scenes for a large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's yeah. going to be earlier, though. It's going to be at 8 o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. So be sure to kind of wake up early, join us. If not, you can always catch the broadcast on YouTube. And yeah, um, yeah we'll have a lot. Thanks a Really, really big chunks of electrons and stuff together. It's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next Bye, time. Bye, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Bye.